Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Gerasimovich, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, the pile of books on my desk grows so large, I fear I will never be able to get out. <laughs> Day 13, Matt has only been heard of by people who can access him on Discord. <laughs> his girlfriend hasn't seen his face in days. Nope, I'm behind all the books. <laughs> well, I'm, in addition, Cameron Lalana. Today, I'm wearing a Ukrainian folk shirt that has little tassels, and the cat I am sitting for has decided that these are her personal uh, little... This this is for her, so she's standing on the edge of the desk right now and batting them, so if you hear any shuffling, that's what that is. <laughs> that's nice of you to entertain the cat like that. <laughs> she would not let me do otherwise, so... <laughs> Uh, this is a podcast where me and my good cat-loving pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're going to be needing those drinks as we take a stab at some socialist realism with part one of Fyodor Gladkov's novel, Cement. And if you'd like a say in what we're reading next and perhaps preventing us from doing three more months of just straight socialist realism, head on over to patreon.com slash tipsy Tolstoy. For as little as $3 a month, you can keep your favorite Russian literature podcast running and join in on fun events like movie night on Discord. And this is, this is a master class in reading a script because Matt is actively editing it while I'm reading. I'm not editing so much as putting little emojis when he says things. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And if you're not interested in Patreon, but still want to help us out, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. Yes, definitely sign up for that email list. We got all the books that we're going to be reading till the end of the year out on our website now, and we'll occasionally mail you some fun stuff about them. So do it. Live it. Love it. Levin. Levin. Uh, well, before we get into the reading today, Matt, what are you drinking? I am drinking a heavy pour of the cheap bourbon called, <laughs> called Larceny that we buy at the store, uh, precisely yeah. for this fact that it is pretty cheap. <laughs> Fair enough. How about you? I'm doing similarly, because as we were reading Socialist Realism, I decided I need a stiffer drink for this one. Also, it's been a pretty lazy weekend. I've basically been mostly reading and watching the new James Bond film, so... I, I scrunched up what I had available, and I am drinking a gin and tonic, which has been poured okay. very stiffly, so we're going to see how, what, what happens at the end of this episode. I thought you said we were about to be a couple of bourbon boys on the podcast, but... <laughs> I wish. Alas. Next week, we can be some bourbon boys. I need to okay. acquire some bourbon first. Okay. Deal. Deal. All right. But before we get into the actual content of Cement, if you have if you've any experience with Soviet literature, you may think, hey, guys... Why? Why would you do this to this to us? This is going to suck. Socialist realism is not a good discipline or just generally fun to read. And to that we say, no, we're reading fun politics of, of gender and changing societies. That's a good time. And Matt's going to tell us before we get into the plot, why actually reading about changing gender roles and an evolving society is actually a good time and not just work. Yeah, take that. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. <laughs> People who have been in my Russian yeah. literature classes in undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think a lot of people, myself included, before I had read Cement, I was I had to read it for class and I was like, this is going to be a waste of time. I'm just going to like, I'm going to plow through it. I'm going to read it in like a day. Well, I still did read it in basically a day, but <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm going to read it really quick. It's going to be great. Uh, and by great, I mean it's just going to be quick, and I'm not going to have to do that much with it. And I started reading it, and I was like, "Wait a minute, this, this, this is pretty good, actually." I mean, it's not good in the way that you're like, "Wow, award-winning literature," but it's good in its own way. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit before I get into. So I wanted to to, to go over four bullet points on Fyodor <laughs> Gladkov um, because I actually didn't know a ton about him. Uh, prior to reading other than the fact that he he wrote cement which is largely considered one of the foundational texts of socialist realism um and, and more on that in a minute but he was he was born to a, a family of old believers which i thought was was interesting to know that uh dude was born in 1883 he's actually he's, he's kind of old <laughs> I, I thought he was younger the more you know the more um, you know the more you know and yeah he got he got pretty much right into it doing uh propaganda work in 1904 for which he was arrested and you know generally as 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 it kind of goes 
Sorry, he wasn't arrested. He was actually exiled uh, for four yeah. years for, for said work. Tomato um, exile. Tomato, tomato, exile. Yeah. <laughs> tomato, tomato, Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in his case, yeah. Um, and he did a lot of work with the Bolsheviks, particularly after the October Revolution. He did a lot of work helping reorganize schools in the aftermath of that um, and in the aftermath of the Civil War. He he fought in the Red Army uh, shortly, and then he did a lot of a lot of writing stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Cement was published in 1925, and it was subsequently re-edited like a lot of lot of times. Um, upwards which, of forty, I think. Upwards of forty, yeah, which was actually surprising, but also actually common for this time period, which is probably not something that. Uh, like, I feel like that's not normal for us when you think about it. You think, okay, you know, you work on it, you revise it before you publish it. And then once you publish it, your work is done. Well, not really so much here. And that creates some interesting tensions and whatnot. But I do personally think reading this 1925 version is the more interesting version uh, of this. Because you, you don't really have a developed socialist realism canon at this point. It's very... It's, it's very new. It's still a, It's still a search for what is going to be... The, the literature of the revolution at this point is still very new. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that I, I, there may be more than one. The only English translation we're familiar with is the Arthur and Ashley translation, which is from the, as Matt mentioned, 1925, which is the original publication before it went through the next, you know, how many, however many years and 40 something revisions. So this is, if you get in English, you're reading the original quote unquote version before it was largely changed which we'll get into a little bit later yeah it's it's the one i recommend reading i i've enjoyed it so far on my on my second read around and so i i draw here on a little bit of background context from uh katarina clark at yale who wrote the basically foundational study of socialist realism in literature she wrote a book called the soviet novel which is a really wonderful and in-depth scholarly look at what is socialist realism what is the soviet novel How does this get developed? And I'm not going to go super in-depth because it would take us the entire episode to go over. (laughs) At least. Suffice to say, if you're interested in reading more about this, definitely check it out. So the main point that Katarina Clark is trying to get across in here, which I think is really good, and it's good that she kind of engages with our preconceptions of what socialist realism is, uh, it, what she kind of starts off by saying is that what we understand to be socialist realism is actually pretty ill-defined. Uh, when it's officially established in 1932, there's kind of these core guiding principles like you know being optimistic, being accessible to the masses, being party-minded. If you had to learn about socialist realism in school, these were definitely bullet points you had to memorize for, uh, uh, you had to rote memorize for a test. But in actuality, Katarina Clark says, uh, yeah, these are all great, but it's a little bit broad to have actually guided any sort of literary practice, uh, which I agree with. That's um, just just those three points aren't terribly uh, definitive or instructive necessarily. And so this book kind of takes a look at how socialist realism, however however defined it may be, uh, kind of develops and what constitutes it, and. Her kind of, well, one of her conclusions and kind of guiding parts of her argument is that the plot structure of socialist realism is kind of the, uh, kind of the main structuring element of it. Uh, She calls it the master plot, uh, which is, you know, it is generally some sort of synthesis of uh, Maxim Gorky's story Mother and Gladkov's Cement. And so Gladkov's Cement here, obviously being this really foundational and important text for the next it's several decades uh and even still i would i would argue uh but it's also interesting to note that a lot of these kind of canonical socialist realist texts they don't always follow the master plot there's a lot of interesting deviations that happen and you know kind of there's differences not every book is you know exactly the same as we were maybe taught to believe or as we have this kind of preconceived notion that okay it's socialist realism it's the basically the exact same thing just different character names well not quite and so one of the things that Katarina Clark pushes back against is the sort of western historiography that reflects the 
situation, broadly put, in Russia as being reflected as the quote-unquote regime and the quote-unquote intellectuals, that there's some kind of battle happening between them. Uh, They're pitted against each other eternally throughout all stages of Russian history. It's true that they do interact, for sure, but they're not these sort of autonomous agents that you know, are operating in sort of a, a, a system apart from each other. No, they're operating within the same system and are actually really influencing each other in addition to... They're really, they're really influencing each other. It's not that the uh, government says, okay, we're going to do this literature now, and the writers are just like, okay, that's fine. Uh, she says, even in the most, essentially, in the most oppressive of conditions, literature is never simply just, you know, what a government wants it to be. It never ends up being that way. And so she says that the movement from politics and ideology to literature was far from being a one-way street, and that's what she kind of goes on uh, to look at throughout the book. And I wanted to kind of, you know, keep that in mind as we read Cement, uh, because this is, again, a foundational text, but also an early text. So uh, more so here even than some of, you know, the later socialist realist texts, there's a, a lot more room for this maybe nuance or a lot more room for Gladkov to go into different areas that would have to be edited out later. Or not, didn't have to be edited out, but, you know, would generally be edited down or toned down to sort of fit this plot and kind of eliminates a lot of the nuance that's present in the 1925 edition. Uh, and and so with that, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, that's it. I think I think that's a good coverage of, of the basis for why we're getting into this this work. Nice. Yes, thank you for the background. So let's talk about cement, and then in parentheses, the 1925 version. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday we'll cover cement 1951 or whatever, where a lot of the um, intricacies and uh, more subtle points have been removed in favor of some some good hardline pro Stalinist line of. Okay, the cat's pushing my hand down. I think she thinks I need to quiet down on that front. Um, <laughs> I think you're thinking too small. I think we're going to do one year where we just spend reading uh, edition to edition. <laughs> okay. M- Matt's joking, but before we started recording, he did send me an article in which the <laughs> author, I think this is uh, Gladkov Cement, The Making of a Soviet Classic by Robert uh, Bush. And at the end, he calls for kind of a bigger work translating the various editions to get an over- overall better idea of the changing from edition to edition. Um, <laughs> we could do that. That could be the project of our podcast for the next year two years forever who knows yeah for me, for just forever become the cement cast <laughs> sure th- tons of people would love that the cement cast the cement cast getting dirty with translation <laughs> one half translation the other half us starting a factory is that anything you think we got it i think we got it let us know i feel like we got it <laughs> yeah yeah send us send us talk to us in discord let us know if you would like that to happen <laughs> if you're tired of talking about Dostoevsky and, and uh, Tolstoy would like to talk more about Gladkov. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Cement. So Cement opens up on our on our hero, sort of. Uh, Gleb Chumilov is uh, a Red Army soldier who's returning to his factory town in uh, Novorossiysk, and he's expecting to have a great return. He's been off fighting for the Red Army for a number of years, and he's so happy to be back home in the in the factory which he grew up in and loves. And he shows up and it kind of sucks. Everything is dirty and broken down and the factory is not working. And the people who he used to know are not acknowledging him. And when he runs into his wife, he's like runs towards her in their house and is like, Dasha, his wife, um, you know, where's uh where's Nurka? I'm I'm so happy to see you both. And Dasha looks at him and is like, Oh, Gleb, um good to see you. And then she kind of gives him a kiss and says, well, I, I got to go to work for the women's section. I'll see you in about two days. And which leaves Gleb alone to wander around until he finally runs into an old friend of his, uh, Savchuk, who is currently in the middle of a fist fight with his wife, Motia. Not the healthiest relationship in the book, but he breaks up the fight and puts the, you know, puts the two to, to eat at ease. And they are both so happy to see him. And they, he finds out that things have changed since he left. Uh, you know, Subchuk and Motsuya's children are dead. You know, the factory's closed down. It's now being used as basically a place to hold farm animals instead of, of any actual industry. And then Gleb says, you know what? This isn't going to stand. We're going we're gonna to open up the factory. And he goes to go check it out, and everything is just, it's broken down. Although, 
to be fair, he does find an old friend of his, uh, Brinza, who has actually been taking care of the machines and kind of, kind of tells him, you know, as soon as we have the power back here, comrade, we could start it up in a day. I've been taking care of the machines. You know, the factory must not die. Otherwise, what the hell did we have a revolution before? This inspires Gleb to try to save the factory. Gleb goes to the factory committee office where he finds that basically nothing is happening. At this point, he's realized that the power of bureaucracy is becoming a major problem. Um, no one can do anything because they're being paralyzed by the new Bolshevik bureaucracy, which has made every life subject to the various committees who can never come to a conclusion who are always waiting t- until the next meeting so they can try to figure out what to do. So this is definitely a common thing. I feel like once anything breaks down into uh, committee meetings, it's over. <laughs> I There's this book, I think... Um, what is it? Spain in Our Hearts by Adam Hochschild. And in it, he recounts the, the death of, one of, of, a, of a Spanish anarchist during the Spanish Civil War, uh, Buenaventura Durudi. And this is probably apocryphal, but it, it said that as he was shot, maybe accidentally, maybe on purpose, he grabs one of his um, comrades and says to him, too many committees before he dies. And it's probably <laughs> apocryphal, but it's still a funny, um, funny story to be passed around, which is a comment on... <laughs> the socialist tendency towards endless committee committee having. Anyway, so Gleb reunites with his wife later on, and they have a greater conversation than before, because before she was heading up to work, and she tells him, you know, I'm different. We've both changed. Um, you know, Nurka, our daughter, was off in the, in the children's house where I work, and, you know, I, I've learned things while you've been gone. I, I'm not just a woman. I'm a person, and I've learned to value myself. It's hard and it's cost me, but no one will destroy that pride. And Gleb says, mm, that's okay. <laughs> I, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, Gleb says, Gleb is like uh, really obsessed with the idea that she slept with someone else during this time. And this is one of the interesting things to him. When she, when he accuses her of that, she kind of turns around him and says, are you saying that you've never slept with anyone else? And Gleb is like, well, that's not the issue. And then secretly says, well, yeah, <laughs> of course I have. But, you know, you're my wife. And this is one of the, the many scenes in which we, this is where... I think where accusations that characters like Gleb or Dasha are two-dimensional fall flat because they're, yeah, they're heroes in their own minds. But if you don't pay attention to how they want themselves to be perceived and pay attention to the actual fact of how they act towards other people, it reveals that they are meant to be imperfect people. And, and, and I mean, you see the shortcomings of Gleb. He, he is meant to be a hero of sorts, and yet he still has these shortcomings, which are obviously portrayed to be a shortcoming. This is, this is a... a a shortcoming of intellectual and, and traditional, you know, patriarchal domination that he feels, which is being called out by Dasha, and that it the the text frames Dasha to be right in that regard. Yeah, I think it's an interesting example of the the book does follow like the overall master plot of the production novel, but there's also this room for the interpersonal dynamics in between some of these scenes. You know, like it it kind of it checks all the major boxes of what you want the the socialist realist plot to be. Uh, but it also is, I don't know, it's not just like, you know, 100 pages of a guy starting a factory. <laughs> Technically it is, but it's a lot more than that. Well, but there's also 200 pages of <laughs> weird stuff happening. Yeah, that's true. So they, after this conversation, they go to the children's home where Gleb sees his daughter and she kind of recognizes him as his, her father, but she's pretty distant from him and Gleb looks around and everything is kind of broken down a little bit it's kind of a life in squalor and he even remarks that people running this should be a shot which is his wife dasha who he's implying should be shot which i don't think he thinks too much about but that's his that's his no. favorite way of dealing with these problems but they, they walk around and he sees the kind of state that this is in and then he decides you know it's time for me to go to the palace of labor to go see these committees and you know change this we need to make this happen so he heads out to this this palace of labor runs into an old friend of his sergey uh, just put a pen in sergey's existence for now um <laughs> And then he goes to go see the the kind of head of the the local. What, actually, God, there's so many there's so many committees. I don't remember which committee he goes to see first. It doesn't matter. He goes around to see various committees. He meets uh, Shibis, the head of the local Cheka. He meets uh, Polly Mikova, who is the head of the women's section where uh, his wife Dasha works, who plays a bigger work a bigger place later on. And he kind of talks to people about what's going on. They all express express discontent with how the the new kind of committee-based system of government is working. Gleb goes to see the the party group, and oh, that's the, the common turn happens before that. Oh god, there's so much, so many fucking committee scenes. I don't remember which happens. <laughs> really where. are now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so after visiting all of these these committees and, and seeing all these old people used to know, they go to a a, a, a workers club where um, they Gleb says, you know, we need to we need to organize things. We need to get this factory working. And first of all, we need to have a leader. We need to have a chairperson. Well, he says chairman and his initial like he needs to have a beard. But there are also a lot of women in the meeting who say that's bullshit. No, we want to put Dasha up for, for a chairperson. And Gleb says, OK, whatever. I'm you know, I'm a worker. I'm. I'm not prejudiced. Let's have Dasha. And um, I forget two other people. Basically, it doesn't matter. And Dasha wins by a landslide. Everyone wants her to be party leader. And then they all have a big discussion about how they should. Four more (laughs) years. They they discuss what what should we do now going forward with the factory. And uh, throughout this discussion, Dasha is continually yelled at by Softshook. He's pretty much trying to shut her down. through this whole time but dasha proves pretty adept in, in actually shutting Savchuk down through this whole process dude gleb would have been so annoying in real life people <laughs> were just like we really want food we haven't eaten in months and gleb's like no we must restart the cement factory <laughs> <laughs> we need wood so we can have fuel so we can start the cement factory back up i know you're starving that's actually another theme of the book that like the requisitions are a little bit harsh on people but kind of does fall a little bit short in the face of we need to get the cement factory working again <laughs> yeah i mean what are you gonna do eat your food no we're, yeah. we're gonna need all that so we can produce cement baby yeah <laughs> So at that that night, they go home, Gleb and, and Dasha talk, and some other things happen. But really the important part, I think, for, for our understanding is when Dasha finally begins to tell him about what she did while he was gone, and which includes the fact that she was with um, other men. And Gleb is so enraged that he begins to attack her. And then Dasha, with just sheer force of will, makes him just like stares him down until he stops and feels bad about himself. And she says to him, you're a communist. It's true. But you are also a brute man, needing woman to be a slave for you, for you to sleep with. You're a good soldier, but in ordinary life, you're a bad communist. Um, <laughs> Dasha's the true hero of this book. Changed my mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so at this point, we move on to chapter five. And the only, the only engineer left in the factory, everyone else has fled the country. Uh, the German engineer, uh, Kleist, has, has stayed. And he was actually once someone who... Almost got Gleb killed when, early, and before the revolution, some white officers took Gleb and some other organizers up to his office. Clay says, hey, I'm not a part of this. You guys do whatever you want. That's out of my business. And only through sure luck does Gleb escape uh, basically being executed in a shed by these white officers. Gleb goes to see him, and at this point, Kleist is a shell of his former self. He's hiding out in the factory, shut himself away, does not interact with anyone, and Gleb frightens him because he thinks now the shoe's in the other foot, so he, he flees, essentially. Uh, but as he as he's kind of taking a walk to go look at the shoreline, he runs across Gleb again, who he notes is like not even chasing me. He's just present. I can't get away from him. And Gleb essentially proposes to him, although Kleist thinks he's here to kill him. You are the only engineer we have left. We need you. I need you to start working on the factory again. And Kleist has a moment of realizing like, OK, I can do this. I can I can bring it back. Continuing on his role, Gleb goes to see uh, another <laughs> executive committee. I don't think it's a committee of anything in particular, uh, but it, this is run by executive committee leader Badin, who is important in his own way. No one can go see Badin. You have to be wait in a long line, be accepted, get pre-approved. Gleb is not down for this. He goes and he marches in the office and he interrupts uh, Badin's meeting and says, hey, we need to talk. Um, Badin, who is not really cowed, but kind of says, okay, let's talk. Let's talk what's going on. And uh, Gleb... Uh, kind of goes on, a, on to rails against him in the way that he's run, the, or the way that the committees have overrided all life. Nothing can happen without their approval now. While, while Gleb is saying, you know, please let us, you know, build the factory again. Don't hide, tie us down to red tape. The chairman of the Economic uh, Council of People's Economy, or sorry, the, the Council of People's Economy, Schramm, enters, and he's the guy who oversees everything. And when Gleb starts questioning him, why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? Schramm basically says, look, man, we're just here to take account of things. We don't do anything. That's this committee's problem. That's that committee's problem. And Gleb says, that's the problem. You eggheads are here to count everything, and you say you're in control of nothing. Why do you exist? We should shoot you all. He wants a lot of people shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but at the end of that, Schramm leaves more or less nonplussed, and Budin says, okay, look, Gleb, I'll bring this up at the next meeting. In the meantime, you can do 
what you want. I, I'm not going to give you any official support, but I'm also not going to stop you. After this, we have a kind of a weird scene where that guy I mentioned earlier, Sergey, a friend, old friend of Gleb's, we suddenly switch to his perspective and he goes to see his parents. Uh, his mother is is dying or at least very sick. And he, he briefly speaks with his father, who is a, a learned man, a man obsessed with books, who's turned their entire house into a library about philosophy before seeing his estranged brother who's fighting for the Reds and they go to see their mother. It's a weird scene. Maybe we'll get into that later in this episode, probably in the second episode if we don't hear. Yeah, that one was weird. <laughs> it is weird. I, I've seen some explanations for it. And I, I, I kind of want to talk to you about them. You might have read them too. That might have yeah, been an essay sure. included in your book as well. Could have been. So, well, well Gleb is out uh, uh, organizing things. Um, but Dean reports that um, uh, a worker of his, uh, Borshi, who is out in the village is trying to requisition more grain and stuff from the peasants, has been attacked by uh, a Russian soldier that he'd uh, sent to go with the guy, and he goes to check it out. Dasha has been meaning to go to this town for some time, so she accompanies Badin, or Badin basically invites Dasha out because he knows she's been trying to go. Uh, Badin has been trying to cow Kasha, Kasha, Dasha for quite some time, and he's been not been able to get one over on her because she's pretty uh, hard of will. So he sees this as a way to maybe finally get that one over on her. Uh, which in this case basically means he tries to assault her while they're on, in the carriage on the way there, which is interrupted by some, it's not really made clear, maybe white forces, maybe green, and greens are local militias who are not, uh, a company, not officially aligned with the whites or the reds in the Civil War. They're just kind of like, don't tread on us. <laughs> not that I'm saying they were the libertarians oh, at that time, but they're kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you know yeah. about the greens before reading this book? I, I did a long time ago. I did some I okay. did some work on on them. I guess I'm a bad student. I I, I I wasn't familiar with the greens until I read this for the first time. I mean, to be fair, the greens don't really matter. They were just like local militias that existed to fight whoever was fight whoever was winning at the time. Yeah, it makes sense. It was just interesting that I hadn't come across it. Yeah, that's fair. I basically only was familiar with them because I did a breakdown on at some point. I did a lot of research into the various factions of the war. And they kind of came yeah. up as like, yeah, they exist. You don't really need to talk about them. There's no ideological underpinning. So, and footnote. <laughs> <laughs> so they're attacked by these these forces, and they the driver of the carriage is killed. But Dean jumps in to take his, his the guy's place, and Dasha distracts the rest. She jumps out to kind of push these these interlopers away, and they capture her and try to hang her. But she is just so strong of will and standing up in their face and faces her death with just no fear at all that the leader of them says, you know what? You're cool. We're not going to hang you. And they write off. <laughs> you good. Yeah. <laughs> it really feels like kind of kind of reminded me of maybe this is just because I read it so recently. The part where in, in the captain's daughter where our friend Peter is not hanged by um, Bukachev. Yeah. yeah. Something, something about the getting saved at the last at the you know, ninth hour. Uh before you get hanged is seems to pop up a lot but although fair it's a dr dramatic happening yeah it also would kind of kill the story <laughs> <laughs> if, if dasha was hanged <laughs> a third of the way through <laughs> not even a third of the way <laughs> yeah like quarter yeah. yeah maybe okay so yeah she so she escapes from them or is let go and staggers all the way into town where she runs into badin who's been organizing forces to come get her and after that, they go around and, and do their duties, and they are so impressed by each other, Badin by Dasha's sheer force of will, Dasha by seeing Badin uh, in action and his indomitable will and, and organizing things that that night they sleep together. And here we come to chapter nine, which is the last chapter we read for this particular uh, part one today, which is the biggest part relating to actually building the factory. At this point, uh, Gleb, who is working with Kleist, has gotten about 5,000 workers, and they're all getting together to get the factory back in order. Uh, while they're doing this, um, Makova, who is the leader of the wound section, kind of seems to have formed uh, a bit of an attachment to Gleb. It's, it's, she kind of hangs out with him, hangs off him, and he begins to notice her. Uh, very notices her heartbeat a lot, it's, it's mentioned, which is, you know, to each their own. Um, but during this process, they are attacked by unnamed Cossacks. It's not really clear who, what side they're on, but they're attacked and everyone begins to take up arms and all, all the soldiers who are there, all the workers who are there, all the men, all the women, they grab the rifles and they begin to fight back. Gleb asserts, uh, begins to take on his old role as a political commissar in the army, orders forces around. He's fighting with Makova. Actually, mostly they're, he's just kind of telling Makova to stay down, but she keeps trying to jump back up she's really excited to be in combat 
after Gleb is almost killed by a Cossack, who is, and he's kind of saved by Makoba, kind of wins himself. It's, it's not entirely clear. Um, they manage to push these forces back, and with, with only just a couple deaths on their side, they, they cheer um, and, and, and celebrate pushing back those forces and say, uh, putting the, the, the dead on a truck, they say, we cannot be stopped. This is, this is our Soviet Union now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is our factory now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we make the cement now. <laughs> we still don't have food, uh, but we do have a functional factory for cement making. <laughs> I am going to make an architecture that is so gray. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to supply so much building material for exactly one building on every U.S. college campus. <laughs> No, not the library. <laughs> it's always the library. I wish it was the library where I went to college. It was like this. Mm. It was the social sciences building, which you can never find your way around. Which I think, I think the professors like to work in there because it meant they no one would ever come to their office hours because no one could figure out mm. how to get there in in the Death Star. Yeah, we have a brutalist library in the. So I was told the design is supposed to make it look like books on a shelf. Interesting. I don't buy it. I was told that the design of the of the Death Star on the Davis campus was to encourage, it was made intentionally confusing to encourage people to talk to each other, to find their way around. I think that's bullshit, but <laughs> I could see where that idea comes from. The fact that you call the Death Star does not bode well. <laughs> it looks like, it looks, <laughs> it looks like the compound that a Romanian dictator would like keep their political prisoners in in the <laughs> 1980s. Oh boy. <laughs> Um, anyway, after hearing all that, you may wonder, hey, Cameron and Matt, you lied to us. That is just the story of some people trying to build a factory, and it is boring. Ah, got you. Well, <laughs> got, got you. It actually was boring this whole time. But actually, there's there's a lot of interesting nuances to examine here. Um, Matt, when you, you so that you've read this now twice, how do you, you, you liked it a lot more this time. What do you think about it? What, what, what kind of comes to your mind when you're walking away from it now? Um, no, I like it equally as much. I, I think I was. I, I, no, it's great. <laughs> Sorry, you said you found it funnier. I guess I, I found it. I found it, it's just great. It's a, it's a good book, you know. That's fair. Yeah, and on, on the second read through, I, I found similar to what I found on the first time. I guess because, uh, to be fair, it's been under a year since my first read of it. But I, I read this for a class that was pretty specifically focused looking at the gender dynamics of the novel. Though to be honest, on, on a on a fresh reread, I still think that's the most interesting part of the novel. Yeah, that was also what stuck out to me most. So yeah, I kind of thought like maybe I was just had only highlighted the things that were relevant to the class that I wanted to talk about, and then I was kind of like rereading, and I was like, no, it just happened to also be <laughs> the most interesting parts of this. I think that's right. kind of like what the like a, the adaptive film term, but it's it's kind of like what the b plot is here i mean that's really what the the interpersonal issue is of, of the book is dasha having a incredibly an incredibly traumatic period during the the civil war that causes you know a, a very new outlook on life and and gleb coming back and trying to to figure out what's you know what's changed and why which is i would imagine if if you were a soldier that was gone for three years during this time it must have looked very different when you came back yeah, I think there are a couple other things to keep an eye on here, but for the most part, in my read too, without even having that context, that was what stuck out to me the most, is how unexpectedly, and I this is, when in some articles I read, I've noted, I, it's been noted, and we'll bring this up later, that that was kind of erased from later features, but Glib, he's the hero of the book, but he's not, he's far from uh, free from criticism, and Dasha lays some pretty devastating criticisms of him, such as that you you want to subjugate women, and that makes you a bad communist. And the, the the conversation ends on that. And he realizes that she's kind of right, not that he wants to admit it. So the text frames Dasha in a lot of ways as being the correct one. Not that she's uncomplicated. She feels difficult about a lot of these things that she's, ways she's changed and the things she's doing. But she's never framed as being incorrect, you know, and it gives her a real person to, to, to allow her to feel, to feel, am I doing the right thing without the text being like, yeah, and she was doing the right thing. You could be doing the right thing or the wrong thing, whatever. She's she's allowed to do her own thing and question it, and it's never, it's kind of put in her hands still. And she's and she's allowed to get one over on Gleb a couple times over on the way he treats women. And I think that's that's what made that really interesting to me. 
Yeah, it was it was interesting like that. Like you said, it's Gleb is the hero, but he's I feel like in the first part, honestly, Dasha is more of the hero than Gleb is actually more dis- disruptive than anything. I mean, I, I know how the, how the book ends. Spoiler alert: the factory starts running. Um, <laughs> but you know, kind of looking at, at the beginning, really, Dasha is doing a lot of the important organizational work for orphans and children, and actually helping. Uh, whereas uh, <laughs> Clef is mostly just disrupting committee meetings and uh, yelling at people. Which has some value, and this, this is kind of where the secondary, I think, plot for me comes in of the fact that Gladkoff is, I don't think, that, I don't know if this is him as a person speaking, but the, 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 committee, the committee system of like endless needing to talk to one other community to have things done, the endless bureaucratization of life, is never directly criticized, but it's posed as pretty silly. I mean, the part where Gleb is talking to Shram and he keeps asking Shram, like, well, what about this? And Shram says, oh, well, in regards to wood, this needs to happen. And then Gleb says, oh, so you know what needs to happen. Why don't you do it? And Shram says, well, that's the industrial committee's concern. And Gleb's like, well, it's not working. You know they're not doing it. So why aren't you trying to fix that? And the guy's just like, well, that's because it's their concern. Also, this other committee's overseeing it. So I wouldn't want to step on their toes. So it's really framed as being kind of ridiculous on its face. And, and Shram is not portrayed as... He's portrayed as kind of a bug-eyed weirdo, too, just to really hammer the point home, um, which is, I thought, interesting. An interesting meditation on some of the changes that he's less comfortable with. I mean, Gleb, the the good communist, and, and when he is portrayed as that, which he is, is often like the, the elemental, almost spontaneousness of Gleb is portrayed as a good thing versus the kind of... the I would almost call, I hesitate to call it conscious because I, I don't think this is a good application of like the conscious, um, spontaneous dialectic here. But it, the fact that he is not he he is not well educated is never posed as a shortcoming, as it might often be in the as a, in a more Leninist work. It, the fact that he's just trying to get out there and undo the bureaucracy, the conscious bureaucracy, is kind of posed as a good thing, which is interesting, an interesting feature of of a Soviet novel, which of course is edited out in later editions, but makes this one really cool. I mean, I think there's a one point when um, Gleb, I don't remember who he's talking to, but uh, the person says to him about the, the people who are overseeing them, uh, they're no sooner got into high positions than they change from friends and comrades into scoundrels, <laughs> that they say about the Soviet administration. This is very obviously the book that was originally released in 1925, when that was a, fair, a fine thing to write. Yeah, there's the part of the Katerina and Clark book that I was talking about earlier, where she talks about the spontaneity and consciousness dialectic that you just brought up um as as one of the forces that helps shape the master plot and it kind of does seem like gleb is the, the more spontaneous character which is not not a good thing when it comes to the kind of leninist model of historical progress that's not it's not what you want to be you want to be the, you want to be the conscious one um <clears throat> meaning you want to have your and just to break in oh yeah oh go ahead Oh, it's just to break in, if you're not familiar with the spontaneity, consciousness, dialectic, uh, you should go listen to our book on Lenin's what is, our, our podcast, excuse me, on Lenin's what is to be done. Basically, the spontaneity in a socialist dialectic is, this is um, action ta- undertaken by individuals or groups to, to fight against injustice, uh, wildcat strikes, unions, etc. Whereas a conscious uh, approach to socialism is, in this case, a uh, kind of a bureaucratic approach where you have a an over, a governing organization who hands down uh, ways of approaching the future. And the, the conscious approach is, is the what's often known as like the, the vanguard of the proletariat or the conscious class who are then directing the unconscious classes how to act to bring them to consciousness. And that's an, a dialectic or a tension we see in, in literature approaching this issue. Yeah, I'm so glad we can finally point people towards that episode that we did. You know, I felt <laughs> like there was going to be a payoff. But then, hey... <laughs> six months down the road we did it boys <laughs> finally covering socialist realism it had a point <laughs> but yeah sorry continue no i was just thinking that it's it's interesting that yeah you know there's there's a lot of things that happen in this novel that kind of made me raise my eyebrow because so when i, when I was thinking socialist realism i was thinking okay it's like i said it's going to be a very predictable plot and to an extent it is in the end that the ending is getting the factory running because of course it is that would be a really stupid book to write if it didn't um (laughs) you know um but it's more of a story of how you get there i think it's interesting that i guess it didn't really follow the model that i thought it would 
or, or the characters maybe didn't develop exactly in the way that I thought they would. It's it's much different during this period, I think, still. Yeah. There's a lot more I think we want to say, but a lot of it kind of, the a lot of development kind of comes down in the second half of the book, which makes it a little bit hard to talk about at this point, other than just some of, mentioning some of the interesting setup that's happening here. And what about motherhood? That's one that I thought that is set up and also developed a little bit here, but it'll be developed even more by the end. Um, see, this is one specifically that I didn't think of at all when I was, you know, before I had read, because I feel like you kind of, when you think of, if you're just like a... <laughs> to stereotype if you're just kind of a general american that hasn't read a lot of russian literature you probably you you wouldn't expect some of the comments on motherhood that you're reading here to come out at this period i i, I thought they were a, a little jarring actually on my my first read um i have one oh yeah toward, towards the end of the, the first half dasha was saying it had seemed to her that her daughter was already dead and that she dasha was no longer her mother and there's like, like strange moments where like you know, people try and tell Dasha, oh, like, you have such a good kid, and yada, yada, yada. And Dasha's like, no, she's just like every other kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, Which I think is it's cool. It's interesting because she's not unconflicted about that. She kind of looks at mm-hmm. Nurka, and she, in her heart, believes, oh, I've got a special relationship to her because she's my daughter. But as she's feeding some some young boys who are not in the, the children's home, they're just kind of on the street, she thinks... Is is Nurka really different to me than these two boys are? Because I, I take care of all the children there. Mm-hmm. And is her relationship to me, does she feel differently towards me? I do towards her, I think. But she, does she towards me? And that's kind of an interesting ambivalence to, to have. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, the text doesn't frame it one way or the other of like, oh, yeah, obviously she's bad because uh, she's given away her kids. Like, certainly people in the story will say it. Uh, Savchuk's... Savchuk and his wife Motsya, uh, they they say, well, you know, how could how could she give Nurka up to the home? We offered to take Nurka in after our children died, and they, they frame it as bad. But when Dasha herself is approaching it, it's it's kind of she's put in her hands, and she thinks on it, and she's not framed one way or the other for for the choices she's made, which I think is interesting. Yeah, it's a new model for raising a family that was you know kind of experimental, but especially after World War One plus Civil War, when there were a lot of orphans like you need a place to take care of these kids and but still it's just interesting that dasha really you know works with these kids but she doesn't have like what you might picture as just this sort of maternal instinct necessarily um quote unquote um she has this to you know more of an instinct to take care of the community as a whole as opposed to this kind of individual protection Right. She's she's a, a good communist in that regard. When 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 Gleb comes home, presumably to try to like sleep with her, she's like, Hey, now is Lenin reading time, actually, buddy. Uh, <laughs> go hang out with your your, your friend Savchuk. That's never the sexiest thing of all. We're gonna read some Lenin. <laughs> and that's kind of her approach towards running this children's home, that it's not as some writers might oppose her, like, oh well, you know, there's a motherly instinct because she's a woman and yada da da da. No, but she she sees that there's a need to take care of a community, and according to her idea of communism, which is that everyone has a place and everyone has is taken care of by the community, she sees that need and she goes to approach that need, and that's that's how she's approaching it, like an administrator almost. And when she needs to go to work elsewhere, she does, and she does what she has to to work through that. I think it's also worth bringing up her. Um, her sexuality as a character because she so as as we mentioned earlier when gleb kind of has his first conversation with her she says to him yeah I, i've had i've had sexual relations with other men while you were gone uh haven't you with other women um and of course her relationship with badin is something interesting to, to i think there's a lot that could be said about that but she's someone who has she's not just a character who is like i'm not just x or y she's a complex character who who's ambivalent about her actions who has a sense of sexuality doesn't even entirely know why sometimes and she mentions like she doesn't even really know why she got into that she decided to do that but she she does have that and that's something that interestingly is deleted in in later editions uh her references to her having having had sex ever with other men is deleted in later editions and especially her the scene where she sleeps with badin is deleted and i think that's interesting that her agency as um as someone who wants or desires sex is taken out of of later editions where they're kind of putting them up to be less real conflicted people and more some kind of vague statue of soviet you know (laughs) we're going to get things done yeah it kind of eliminates a lot of the the human element that i thought was surprisingly present in the novel in favor of the cement element which i figured would be yeah um so basically our, our thesis so far is dasha's the real hero don't add us
Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah. So, um, the the what the, a lot of the analysis of Dasha's character I'm taking from the Hardening of Cement: Russian Woman in Modernization by Pavla Vasila, which I will link in the show notes of this episode. Really interesting read. Um, I think it builds on a lot of the ideas which you might come away from if you're focusing on this element as you're reading the book. But very helpful. I recommend that you do. It's a good aspect to focus on if you're if you're just looking to to dip your toe in a little bit. Probably the most interesting element. I think it is the only interesting element, <laughs> but there's enough of it to sustain a legitimate interest. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's an interesting book in the same way I, I approach uh, what is to be done by Chernyshevsky. I think there are interesting ideas and it's worth engaging with, but it doesn't have the greatest prose. Is is what is to be done by Chernyshevsky a more interesting book than Fathers and Children by Turgenev? I think so. Would I read Fathers and Children over several times before I ever read What is to be Done Again? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> That's kind of the same way I think about this book. Yeah, I think this is better than What is to be Done. Oh, I agree, yeah. I, I think that because a lot of times we don't think of socialist realism as being good because we think it's government-dictated propaganda, et cetera, et cetera, that we tend to think that it's not art. But I would say that this is definitely an example of artistry. I don't. I wouldn't make that argument for what is to be done. I actually don't think I would. No, I, I, I'm in complete agreement. I think one of the major differences is that what is to be done, characters are not characters, they're mouthpieces, which is, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. In this piece, characters truly do feel like characters. They they have an internal life. They have a strong belief system, which is the novel is in, in, in agreement with, more or less, depending on who they are. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have these human characteristics of conflict or or shortcomings or whatever it may be, which I think makes this a really interesting work. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm glad we finally got to cover it on the podcast a little bit. Yeah, and um, we're going to be covering... There's a lot more ideas which we want to talk about, which I can't until we get to the second half of the plot. Yeah, we got a lot more to go through. The second half's going gonna, gonna to be off the chain. <laughs> you thought you were safe. You're never <laughs> safe. <laughs> no, all a month. <laughs> Someday we're going to announce a series on Dostoevsky or something. And then you're going to excitedly tune into the first episode and then surprise, we're actually the cement cast now. <laughs> it's just going to be, it's going to be how this deal was tempered. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, welcome to the Soviet lit cast, Soviet lit cast, where we don't even analyze, we are just reading the book into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming next. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matt, I think that's, um, unless you had anything else to cover for today. No, I am great. Okay, well then, Just in, in that general, case, before we... But I'm also good to stop here. That's fair. <laughs> well, before we, we completely stop here, I gotta ask, on a scale of one to Yeltsin, and I would use a character here, but none of the characters are, are drink, really, how drunk are you? Uh, probably six or seven. You know, if, if my if my head was the cement factory smokestack, you know, I've almost got smoke coming out of my ears, <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> nice, nice. How about you? At the at the at the break, which you didn't hear because we carefully edited that out, I went to go get another gin and tonic, but I was out of tonic, so I'm just drinking straight gin now. Uh, so that puts me at a solid six or seven, maybe an eight, actually. Oh, right. So Ooh, similar to you, danger zone. <laughs> well, um, yes. Uh, what are we? And this is already apparent, but what are we going to be tackling next time around, Matt? It may be a bit of a surprise, but we are going to be doing the second part of Cement by Gladkov. If you are planning on reading that with us, and you haven't picked up a book yet be sure to pick up your copy through our affiliate links on our website yes read it for the ideas if you read a long three-page description of a factory and think this sucks it's okay to skim that that isn't necessarily it's important not part. that bad it's not that bad <laughs> <laughs> matt and i've been arguing over this i i don't like the pros matt's defending it yes look at it yourself i you I'm come to your own conclusion on the pros slurp up the soviet ornamentalism <laughs> I think this series is going to lead to Matt um, retranslating cement for modern, for mo more modern language. It definitely <laughs> the, the translation we have is a bit outdated. Yeah, it is. I don't think it's been. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure if there actually is a, a more recent translation or not. I don't. I don't think there is. This was like the, the main one that I found when I was. Yeah, yeah. If you do read it, you will notice a lot of very outdated language. I think Matt. We were talking about this earlier. There's a part where Gleb is yelling at some committee members and says, you know, you should all be shot for all your endless palavering. No one has ever used the word palaver since Stephen King wrote The Dark Tower. Um, and no. I'll, I'll fight you. If anyone else, if you bring up contradictory evidence, I'm going to say that you're lying and uh, gaslighting me. Uh, no one uses that word. 
This is a very old translation. I enjoy that when you look up Cement Gladklov on Amazon, uh, you do get the book that we're reading from, and then you just get things to help make cement. <laughs> cement adjacent tools. I looked up cement on JSTOR and I forgot to use the advanced search, and I just got pictures of cement blocks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Anyways, uh, before we totally wrap up, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons. We've got Drew, Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Jesse, Madeline, Alex, Daniel, Irini, Paige, Darren, Larkin, Lou, Brandon, Allison, Gary, Cole, Daniel, Jack, Lucy, Alex, and Roland. Ooh. Podcasting isn't free, and grad school doesn't pay very well. So if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.